nice to have you with us. I'm Leland Vittert. Welcome to Friday. And on this Friday, we have a thought for you to think about over the weekend. Think about a billion dollars. No, really, think about right now if you had a billion dollars. But keep watching the TV. Don't go buy a yacht. That would be a thousand piles of a million dollars. So take a million dollars and line it up a thousand times. Now think about if you had to give it away to help people in America who were wronged. What group or groups do you choose? Who's the most deserving? Think about that while we tell you who the Biden administration wants to give it to. Illegal immigrants who came across the border with children. Sometimes it was their kids. Other times it was the kids the cartels sold so the adults had a better chance of staying in America. Either way, the Trump administration, the kid under the Trump administration, the kids and the adults were separated. Here is then DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen explaining why. Part of the country, if you have a family and you commit a crime, the police do not not put you in jail because you have a family. They prosecute you and they incarcerate you. Illegal aliens should not get just different rights because they happen to be illegal aliens. Let's be a little more nuanced about the situation. Border Patrol agents were placed in an impossible situation. One option, keep, quote, families together, knowing that many of the kids were being trafficked by people who weren't their parents, were at risk for abuse, to be sold into prostitution, and worse. The other option was to break up the families, get the facts, and try to reunite them at some point. From a policy perspective, reasonable people can disagree about whether the Obama-era policy that Mr. Trump expanded was the right and humane thing to do. But really? Because of that policy, people should get a half a million dollars. Here's the Wall Street Journal reporting yesterday. U.S. and talks to pay hundreds of millions to families separated at the border. The government's considering payments of 450000 per person affected by the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy in 2018. Do the math. 450000 per person. 550,500 children were separated from adults. We may never know whether it was actually their parents. And remember, the parents at the time, parents, if they were their parents, were given a choice. Here's Chad Wolf, former acting DHS secretary, on the program last night as this news broke. A lot of these parents were given the choice that they could uh, take their, their child or their minor back to their home country when they were removed. Because again, they have no legal right to be here in the United States and almost Without uh, exception, those parents chose to leave the minor here in the United States. And as part of this proposed settlement, there's one more thing. In addition to the cash, everybody gets to stay in the United States, even though they came here illegally. Again, reasonable people can disagree on immigration. But are these the mo people most deserving of $500,000 from the rest of us? To help us answer that question, Anastasia Tanello, an immigration attorney, joining us now. Nice to see you, ma'am. We appreciate you Hi. taking the time. Thank you. Um, eventually, you're going to pop up here on the screen. But anyway, I, I guess my question to you is $450,000. First off, a lot of that's going to go to the lawyers, right? <laughs> Well, just to clarify, I mean, this we're looking at the the report, the reporting that was in the Wall Street Journal. I've seen it in the Washington Post. Um, this is on the basis of a class action and I think some individual lawsuits. So these are individuals who are suing the government based on their rights being violated. Their having they have an action and this is based. I'm you know I haven't seen the the, the suit, but our own Inspector General in January released a report that basically did find some major problems with the, uh, the, the policy under uh, the Trump administration, which now the Biden administration has inherited. So, um, you know, I think we're not sure exactly what is going to be offered to the families or if it's going to be litigated. But right now we know it's, it's, it's just something yeah. that's a suit that's been filed. Yeah, well, well, more than a suit that's been filed, there's already these settlement talks going on, and this number had to come from somewhere. Mitch McConnell retweeted saying no to the U.S., uh, to the Wall Street Journal reporting to us paying this. But uh, again, I get back to this. Uh, you represent a lot of legal immigrants, correct? I, do, should they also get $450,000? 
Well, anyone who has a claim can make such a claim. So if there is some violation of due process, someone can file a suit. So, you know, I don't have anyone right now that I think is in the same position, uh, you know, as, as what happened on the, the border with the children being separated from their parents. And I don't think every single family or, you know, I think there are some situations that maybe weren't um, necessarily parents with their children, but there are many that were. And I think that those were the ones that will probably get more of the credibility and more of the attention in these lawsuits. You, you think about the, just sort of the number, and, and obviously there's lots of different things going on, but you think about the 13 families of the sailors and Marines who were killed over uh, in Afghanistan at, at the uh, air base in Kabul. Uh, they didn't get $450,000. They certainly have had pain and suffering and are separated from their kids. Uh, where does the court, where would a court come up with a number for someone who committed a crime uh, and then the government followed their own rules? Well, as with any lawsuit, it would just, it would depend on the, the specifics of that case. So I think with any kind of settlement, this is to avoid having to go through the legal court system to save time, to save money. Uh, you know, sometimes with settlements, as, as you would know, they, you know, you, you agree to something to, to close it, to, to move on, to give some closure to the, the, the issue. So, I mean, I think that the fact that these Congress people found out about it from the from the news, um, you know, and it, it isn't something that is actually, actually, you know, nothing has been settled, nothing yeah, has it's, been. It's certainly going to have a, a big a chilling effect on any negotiations, you might think. Uh, Chad Wolf, uh, who obviously knows a lot about what happens on the border, um, had this to say about the law of unintended consequences for these uh, possible settlements. Take a listen. Folks south of the border don't quite understand that. All they know is they hear amnesty, or in this case, they hear payments, and they're going to continue to try to come to that border hoping that they will receive it. Certainly, you can agree with that. Well, I mean, acting former acting Secretary Chad Wolf has his the own own issues. Considering there's there's plenty of issues with okay. a lot of the um, mandates and policies that were directed under his acting leadership because he was never actually appointed and confirmed as secretary. So you know there okay. there's some legal problems with a lot of the. the I'm sure that's and an answer. I'm sure that's an answer to a question. I've asked a lot of them, haven't gotten an answer to any of the questions I asked. Uh, thank you. Appreciate uh, you being here and your advocacy for your clients. It's good to see you. As we speak, there's another caravan on the way. Currently, there are about 4,000 or so heading up through Mexico towards our southern border. 4,000 men, women, and children, as you can see from. Uh, this video. That's where they are, somewhere between southern Mexico and Mexico City. Ali Bradley's been traveling with them, joins us now on the road 700 miles south of Mexico City. Uh, Ali, we last checked in with you two days ago. We heard that so far no one had been stopped. Uh, has that changed? No, so Leland, we know that a couple of people have been detained, only a couple hundred, but what one of the caravan organizers tells us, he tells us that they pick people up along the way. So we're still at around 5,000, just under 5,000. I told you yesterday, we had about 1,700 kids. We are looking at around that number still. They're still calling this the March of the Children. There are 63 pregnant women here, and it is hot out here. These people have been walking in 10-mile spurts. We just left. One camp that they were at, my uh, photographer right now is going to show you guys what's going on out here. And you can see just how many people are out here walking. And again, we have been walking with them now for a full week straight and in these 10 mile increments. And what has happened in the past is one of the other uh, caravan leaders, Irenejo Mujica, telling us that what the strategy has been for Border Patrol and for law enforcement, like the National Guard, has been to tire them out, wait so that they can grab people out when they get a little bit tired. But the thing is, he said that strategy isn't going to work this time because they're stopping very often. Now, yeah. we also said that immigration today pretty much gave them the offer to say, hey, if everybody wants to stay here in Mexico. All right, we were worried about that. Allie, work, shot. All or what? They can do that. Let's keep walking. Hey, hey Allie, your, your shot's sort of freezing. Am so I, if you just stay in one place, that'd be great. Sometimes it takes up a little bit of 
okay. too much of the cellular connection when you're moving. I wanted to play this soundbite okay. from you from Mike Pence real quick. Uh, take a listen, then we're going to get your reaction. Literally, from the time the election was settled out, people started coming north because the Biden administration, the Biden campaign, was sending a message Wait. of open borders. And people were literally showing up at our southern border saying that they had come because of President Biden. Are you still hearing that from the group there, that they're here because of President Biden? Yeah, you're absolutely right. That is what the most of them are saying. You know, one of the caravan leaders says, hey, we're going to Mexico City. They want to stay in Mexico. And I said, well, most of the people that I talk to, that isn't the case. The majority of the migrants want to go to the U.S. And they say it's because now is the time to do it. Now is the time because Mr. Biden is, quote, a good man. And he's going to honor his promise. The promise that they're talking about is if they have that valid asylum claim, then they have an opportunity in the U.S. And it's, it's starting to rain here, and this has been happening every single day yeah. for these folks here in this caravan. Well, it, you, you speak both to two issues. One, the desperation that people clearly feel and the hardship they're willing to go through to get to America. And on the other hand, why they feel once they get here, they're going to be let in. We talked to people on the border also who, who claimed asylum and had almost like they were reading from a script. Each one of them had almost exactly the same thing to say about their asylum claim and why they were uh, here in the United States when we were there. Allie, uh, great work as always. Thank you. Safe travels back to the United States. We'll check in soon. Thanks, Leland. No, it didn't. It came up and just talked about the fact that he was happy I was a good Catholic and I should keep us in the community. That's President Biden today after his meeting with the Pope. He's spending the weekend in Rome before heading to a big climate conference in Scotland. Even Politico admits the Biden administration is at a disadvantage, writing John Kerry is holding a weak hand. Speaking about Mr. Biden's climate envoy, China just announced they aren't going to do much in the way of helping as the world's biggest polluter, China, faces an energy crisis at home. John Moody wrote a book about China. Of course they knew, a fictional account of COVID. He was also my former boss at Fox News, Rome bureau chief, for Time Magazine and joins us now. Nice to see you. Uh, welcome back. Thank you. We'll start with your expertise from Rome. You really think the president and Pope talked for 90 minutes and abortion didn't come up once? I think that's what they want to say. Um, you know, the, the, the Pope, any Pope, but especially this Pope, wants to be um, positive in his messages. He doesn't want to criticize, especially leaders that agree with him on almost everything, as President Biden seems to do. The one area where they disagree, apparently, is you know Joe Biden believes that abortion ought to be legal and available. Uh, clearly, this pope has not departed from the Catholic Church's hard line about abortion. And therefore, they have agreed not just to disagree, but agreed not to bring it up. So I think they probably talked for 90 minutes. I think they exchanged pleasantries and gifts. But, um, you know, they, they have mastered, they've both mastered the art of, of speaking without saying anything. <laughs> what do you make of the, the pomp and circumstance of this visit with President Biden versus other presidential papal visits, either at the White House or at the Vatican, which is probably second only to Buckingham Palace and rolling out the red carpet? Yeah, well, the, the Vatican knows how to uh, how to do things uh, the right way. They, they, they have a long history of diplomacy, about 2,000 years, in fact. Um, I, I think this was about standard. Uh, there was the, the um, surprising development last night when the Vatican announced that it would not permit live coverage of Mr. Biden's arrival uh, to the Vatican. They did just do some, some clips, obviously, as you're showing right there. But, um, you know, that was a snub. That, that was, an, a, that was an, a little attempt to tell the White House, you know, your press secretary insulted Catholics yesterday in a press conference, in a press briefing. Don't do it again. Hmm. You think about this from the White House perspective. Uh, they clearly left not getting, they left the United States not getting the win they wanted. Uh, Democrats didn't pass either of the two bills that Biden wanted in Congress. He heads over to Rome, as you pointed out, a little snub. You don't have the, the live coverage for hours and hours of pomp and circumstance on cable television because Vatican TV uh, didn't put it out live. Now he heads into the G20 and then to the climate conference. Uh, it's pretty difficult for the White House now to spin this as the president's in a powerful position. Yeah, right. I mean, look, Joe Biden looks like a guy that got out of Dodge just before the posse caught up with him. 
and uh, you know he he is he is going into this uh, summit um, with a, a lot of talk. You know, America is back. Well, America is back. What? America is back on its knees. America is back apologizing. It's very difficult to believe that he is in a command position now. He gave the Pope a command coin, but uh, that's about the only command he has his hands on. Well, interestingly enough, you make that America's back apologizing. The first thing he said to Emmanuel Macron, the French president, was, do I need to apologize? That over the, the submarine kerfuffle. But let's now look forward to Monday. Uh, this is the global climate conference in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. The president was supposed to walk in with all of these things America was going to do, a bill that had been passed, trillion spending on climate. He doesn't. Uh, how much do you think the White House is going to be willing to give away to just try and get any kind of win? Or what, what would classify as a win for them? Joe Biden is going in with a lot of hat and very little cowboy behind him. Um, he, is, he is, first of all, going to make pledges that are going to further make it more difficult for Americans to live under the uh, uh, economic restrictions that this policy of his that he wants to try to have Congress pass uh, is going to impose on people. Electric rates are going up, gas rates are going up, gasoline at the, at the pump is going up. And, you know, it's as though America is the only polluter in the world and he wants to apologize for it. China just said it's going to increase its import of coal because it has a, an energy crisis. Nobody talks about that. I don't see Greta Thunberg out there yapping about China. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, Ch the Chinese love to yap about everybody else. They hate when people yap about them. Uh, you're one of the few who do. It's why you have, we have you on. Good to see you, sir. As always, have a great weekend. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Leland. Yeah. Arguably the most polarizing figure in the pandemic is facing calls for answers after more cruel dog experiments. We're going to tell you why Anthony Fauci has some new problems from Capitol Hill, from Democrats, too. But first, Virginians are already turning out for the highly contested gubernatorial race there. Live to Virginia ahead of the big vote. If Republican Glenn Youngkin wins the Virginia governor's race, it will be the biggest political surprise since Donald Trump's improbable 2016 victory. And for the first time tonight, in the entire race, the real clear politics average of polls shows the businessman pulling ahead of Democratic legend, legendary fundraiser, and former governor Terry McAuliffe. Pretty stunning news. Kelly Meyer is live now in Northern Virginia as early voting is continuing. Hi, Kelly. Hey, Leland. Well, we were in two Democratic counties today. Here in Alexandria, Biden won with 80% of the vote in 2020. This is where McAuliffe needs voters to turn up in order to win on Tuesday. Now, we've been across the Commonwealth this week, and what we've seen is two Virginias out of 133 counties. Six are pivot, meaning went for Obama in 2012, and then they went for Trump in both 2016, and he held on to it in 2020. This is where Glenn Youngkin is trying to juice that Republican turnout. Why do you like Youngkin? He's I not like, he's, he's not McCullough for one thing. McCullough didn't do a good job as governor before, to me, personally. Um, and I like what Youngkin stands for. What Youngkin stands for and what he's been campaigning on this week is parents' involvement in their kids' education. And that's been huge with moms and dads we've talked to on the trail this week, Leland. Yeah, we've seen education become the very first thing now the very most important issue in the Virginia governor's race. As you've spent time on the trail over the past month or so, tell us how this momentum shift has happened. Yeah, I mean, we've really seen this shift to Yunkin. Republican, or Yunkin has this Republican momentum here. We've seen it mostly based off of this huge part of education really resonating with parents across Virginia. We've seen it this week while we were on the trail in central and southern Virginia. But this could be the chance for a Republican to take back the governor's mansion for the first time after eight years of Democratic control. That enthusiasm has really translated into some of the polls that show Yunkin up by eight points. Others have them neck and neck. For McAuliffe to win, he needs to pick up a big 
lead in early voting. We're out here at an early voting site in Alexandria because some polls show election day voters will break strong for Republicans. Here are some call of supporters today. We need all the support that we can get. So we got to just stay strong because we don't want the same thing to happen to us last year. And it might be working. We talked to one couple who left one polling location because it was so busy they had to go to another to cast their ballot. And now early voting here at this location has ended for the night, but we've seen about 20 people go up and trying to go in after it closed to cast their ballot. So they just have until tomorrow at 5 p.m. to cast their early vote. Otherwise, it's up to Tuesday. Statistically, it's Democrats that come out early and vote. And Virginia has one of the longest early voting periods in the country. Leland? All right, we'll see you on the trail. Kelly, thank you. For more on the Virginia's governor's race, we turn to White House columnist for the Hill, our good friend Niall Standage. Niall, good to see you as always. All right, who's who of Democrats have been out on the trail? President Biden, the First Lady, Kamala Harris, President Obama, Cory Booker of New Jersey. Why do you just get the feeling that the Democratic enthusiasm isn't there? I think that the two things are intimately linked, Leland. I think that the reason that all these people are out is to try to gin up some democratic enthusiasm. To your question and to Kelly's report, I was at a rally where President Biden spoke with Terry McAuliffe on Tuesday night in Northern Virginia. That was a small crowd for a president of the United States. The McAuliffe campaign said there were two and a half thousand people there. I don't think it was even that large. So that goes to this question of voter enthusiasm. Voter enthusiasm, at least on the Republican side, is coming from this education issue that's gone from a distant fifth or sixth in September to now the number one issue among independents. It's the number one issue by a long shot. Chicken or egg, was it Glenn Youngkin who started talking about immigration or is talking about education and that's what moved it up? Or was it always important and Yunkin just capitalized on it and was able to articulate it? I think a little bit more the second. To me, Leland, we have seen education and local school boards become a much more um, politically active issue in the past few months. Part of it's the pandemic, part of it is so-called wokeness. A part of it is the idea that, frankly, school boards tend to lean liberal and more conservative parents are trying to counteract that by getting engaged. So I think you have all of these uh, factors or dynamics that were simmering just below the surface. And Glenn Youngkin, to his uh, political credit, picked up on that. Yeah, he, Glenn Youngkin's also picked up to his political credit on this incredibly tight tightrope to walk between not embracing President Trump, but embracing MAGA ideals, but not, in, not alienating MAGA voters but also not alienating suburban women who don't like Donald Trump's rhetoric. It's been unbelievable to watch. How worried are MAGA Republicans that you talk to that if Yunkin wins, President Trump becomes far less relevant in the Republican Party? That could happen. There is the potential for that. Glenn Youngkin has, as you say, walked a very narrow line. But if you look at, for example, his television advertising, it's very un-Trumpian. It talks a lot more about his biography. It's not really uh, sort of red meat for MAGA country at all. I think that's an attempt to appeal to the kind of suburban voters that you mentioned. I think that the danger for MAGA Republicans is that the Yunkin campaign is providing a kind of different template that at the very least is making him competitive in a democratic leaning state and could lead him to winning the kind of upset victory that you mentioned. Yeah, Biden plus 10 in Virginia. It's interesting, you hear Terry McAuliffe say Donald Trump's name infinitely more times than you hear Glenn Youngkin say it. Hey, Niall, great talking to you. We'll see you next week when we're in DC. On that note, don't forget, we're heading on the road to cover the Virginia governor's race, live from the University of Richmond in Virginia on Monday, election day, we will be with Niall in our nation's capital. When we come back, beagle, pu pu beagle puppies, they're really cute, infected with mutated bacteria, fed to hundreds of ticks, then killed the whistleblower who blames Anthony Fauci for this and what Democrats in Congress want to do about it. Plus, 
New York City on the brink amid concerns about a shortage of first responders. The vaccine mandate kicks in. What businesses are doing to stay safe as cops are off the beat. We answered countless, countless calls, countless EMS emergencies, and we are citizens of the United States of America. And the, the ability to choose is our God-given rights. We work tirelessly, long hours, without fear, boldly, took care of us as the citizens of the city of this New York. We are citizens of the United States of America. New York! Zero to zero. Just about a year ago, you might remember that people were banging pots and pans at five o'clock every night in New York City for the nurses and first responders. Well, as you just heard, the first responders are pretty angry right now. They're protesting the vaccine mandate for city workers, which began kicking in two hours ago. Workers who cannot get proof that they have gotten at least one shot will be on unpaid leave starting on Monday. All right. NYFD, the fire department, already warned they would close 20%. That's one in every five firehouses. 20% of their EMS teams. That could mean 150 fewer ambulances. There are doctors warning that people will die because of this. And also, just under four in 10 street cops. So more than a third of every police officer, uh, the police force, not yet vaccinated as of two days ago. The city of New York's offering $500 incentives, but as you just heard, uh, there's a lot of people who probably are not going to take those incentives. Some business owners are now hiring private security and getting ready for potential violence. Joining us now, Strasmore Fogan, Brooklyn restaurant owner who has a couple of places there. What's this weekend going to be, be, be like, Stratus? Well, this hits home pretty, you know, pretty for my whole team. In March 2020, I saw, I saw an emergency room head on, and I saw what these first responders were doing for us. And we rallied the troops. We put all our vendors together, and we donated over 8,400 meals to our healthcare heroes. And you know, this hurts a lot that they're making you know our first responders do something against their will. I mean, it's not the America that I live in. And, and you know what? The vaccine is there to protect me, not the unvaccinated. And I'm really concerned because this is a typical political decision from Cuomo to De Blasio. They made decisions regarding small business. But they never ran a small business. And I'm really concerned now on what's going to happen here when we've disenfranchised the police and the, N uh, and the FDNY. What are you hearing from fellow restaurant owners and, and yourself about, about this weekend going forward? Are, are more security? Are you closing earlier? What, what are folks worried about? I, I mean, thank God at Brooklyn Chop House, we have you know, a very, a, a very cli a clientele that's never caused trouble. But uh, yeah, we're concerned that this is the start of something that's going to turn ugly. And, um, you know, and these mandates continue. And I'd love to ask Mayor de Blasio, is, why is the attack always on the hospitality industry? You know, mm -hmm. half the storefronts in New York are food driven. And, and as per Cuomo's numbers, 1.5% of the spread were restaurants versus 74.5% at home gatherings. So Obviously, consumers are safest at restaurants. Yeah, you know, so why also, is this continuously happening? Yeah, and also, if you think about it, uh, people all around the country hearing this news are less likely to plan trips to New York City, especially after seeing some of the violence there. The other thing that people have been seeing now is trash piling up on the streets, which was an issue, but now appears to be even more of an issue because this mandate also applies to sanitation workers, and there's almost a strike, for lack of a better term, going on, or a wildcat strike over this. Uh, is that really a thing? Or what are you going to do with the trash? I mean, bravo to de Blasio. He's disenfranchised and divided, not just FDNY, NYPD. Now we're adding Department of Sanitation to that list. I, I mean, he has to reflect on what he's doing here. He's totally disenfranchised the three services that we need to stay healthy. And, and garbage is part of it. We need this garbage to be removed. You know, what's going to happen next with, with rodents and roaches? I mean, this guy has ruined every department that keeps mm. us safe. Yeah, the, uh, New York's finest, New York's bravest, and New York's strongest. Uh, Straight Stratus, it's good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks. having me. Keep up the great work. It's hard. Florida has done exactly the opposite of New York. They've defied the critics who slammed the state's resistance to mandates. Over the summer, Florida had some of the highest COVID case numbers in the country, but now cases 
are plunging to among the lowest. The Daily Mail asked, how did Florida end up with one of the best COVID-19 case and death rates in the United States, despite government DeSantis refusing to mandate masks or vaccines. Let's bring in Liberty Vitter, professor at Washington University in St. Louis, features editor of the Harvard Data Science Review, Mark and Carol Vitter's favorite child. Liberty, good to see you. Uh, all right, is has Florida done that well when you consider simply the case numbers that right now are really low and in some blue states are really high? Well, sure. I mean, you can sort of say that, that the cases are low right now, but they were super high a month ago. And looking at cases, all states go up and down, and there's tons of explanations. Summer revelers are gone. Who knows? But it's really the wrong metric to look at if we're trying to evaluate something like mass mandates or vaccine mandates. It's just for of the moment it's low. Yeah, and that's what we're showing right now. New cases per 100,000 people. Florida is the very lowest. New York way up, almost double there. All right, so that's sort of like looking at, I guess, one baseball game, the box scores, and now talking about the whole season. If we put up death rates for states, both blue states and red states, Florida is among the worst uh, behind Mississippi, Alabama. Actually, Florida's seventh or eighth worst, but it's also behind New York and just ahead of Massachusetts and way below New Jersey and Louisiana. What does that tell us? Well, so you have to realize this is the list of the top eight states most responsible for total COVID deaths. And in fact, if you look at it, four red with, with really hardly any types of lockdowns or mass mandates, and four blue with tons of lockdowns and still have tons of mass mandates. So what it means is that we really don't know if these lockdowns and these mandates work or not. How do we figure that out? Because they're still going on right now and there's still such a push by at least a group of blue governors and mayors to keep them in place. Well, unfortunately, we're not going to know. It's a time will tell kind of issue. I mean, one explanation is that Florida has, you know, higher cases a month ago and lower cases now because it was young people who are getting it and they are not getting really sick or dying of COVID. And then older people, which Florida is full of, have all been vaxxed. So they're not dying. So that's why the death rate is so much lower. But really what government officials and health officials should be saying is that we don't know. And unfortunately, they are frequently <laughs> wrong, but never in doubt. And I think that's really the biggest issue is that we don't know if these things work or not. And unfortunately, no one has been willing to say that. They haven't no. been able to tell the truth. And that's what is causing vaccine hesitancy and the public's lack of trust. Yeah. Frequently wrong, but never in doubt. I was going to say the same thing. Uh, we both know it because of our grandfather. So there you go. Liberty, have a great weekend. Thank you. Speaking of someone else who is often wrong but never in doubt, Dr. Fauci. COVID has made him a household name and one of the most divisive figures in America. One thing, though, that isn't divisive, our love of dogs. See the beagle there? Pretty cute. It appears Dr. Fauci is on the other side of that argument. For the second time this week, we are learning about gruesome experiments on dogs funded by the Fauci-run division at the National Institutes of Health. According to a new report, the NIH funded Kansas State University's veterinarian school with a half a million dollars to experiment on more beagles, specifically 18 six-month-old beagles. The experiment, which is ongoing, infects the dogs with mutant versions of a bacteria that's transmitted by ticks. This is the diagram that the 2020 paper shows the process of the experiment, which is not over. It's expected to end in 2024. Joining us now, Leighton Woodhouse, independent journalist who uncovered the latest NIH contracts, as well as Kathy Guillermo of PETA. Appreciate both of you being with us. Um, Leighton, I'm going to start with you. How did you uncover this? Um, well, I um, have been working with an organization called the White Coat Waste Project. Um, they are a uh, nonprofit uh, advocacy organization that fights um, federal funding of animal testing. Uh, they have been doing Freedom of Information Act um, requests on um, NIH and NIAID for, um, for a long time. They've unearthed a whole lot of really heinous details about these experiments. Um, and so that, that's what I was reporting on. Yeah, well, incredible stuff that you've uncovered. Kathy, 
there's times that there are experiments done on animals and reason people can disagree whether or not some of them need to be done. But specifically, this study that we're hearing about and the study earlier uh, about some parasite medication that NIH funded, have you all been able to find any viable scientific reason for this research? There really isn't any longer any scientifically viable reason to use animals. We've known for a decade that 90% of this basic research involving animals doesn't lead to any cures for human beings. 95% of new medications that test safe and effective in animals fail in human clinical trials. So NIH and NIAID and Anthony Fauci and Francis Collins need to move beyond this very outdated scientific research paradigm now onto better animal-free cutting edge research technology. Yeah, we, we've, we've heard from people in the medical world, at least in the academic world, one of the reasons that this is done on animals is because the amount of money involved for researchers, publisher parishes, it says, Congresswoman Nancy Mace joined us earlier this week and told us pretty interestingly that this was so grotesque of a study, at least the earlier one in the week, they had to outsource it to a lab in Tunisia in North Africa. Listen to her explain why. Uh, there are Republicans and Democrats across the entire country who are really fired up and angry about what we're doing to animals. We won't do it in this country. The FDA says, hey, uh, this doesn't need to happen. These kinds of drugs don't need to be tested on animals. So we sent our taxpayer dollars overseas to do them in other countries instead. And it's, it's horrific, it's gruesome, it's medieval, and it's tragic that we're sending these puppies to slaughter. Hey, hey, Kathy, is there any way to actually put an end to this? Because you've got these government contracts and Fauci has been in trouble with this before. You're certainly your organizations put stuff out about it and nothing changes. We need to get rid of the leadership at NIH, not just Francis Collins, whom we've been advocating to leave for several months now, unfortunately he will be, but all of them. We've got a plan, we call it the research modernization deal. It's a way to phase out these animal experiments and put in better methods, but we need to have the old guard and the people who are re raking in the funds for these experiments and, and simply publishing papers about them to get out of the way and make way for new science. Yeah. All right. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Leighton, when we have you back next, I'm going to get a little bit more on the, le uh, the links between Dr. Fauci and uh, these contracts. Unfortunately, we're running a little tight on time. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has been charged for an alleged sex crime. The AG who took him down just happened to announce her bid for governor in less than 24 hours after those charges were filed. You think it was a coincidence? We'll ask a man who might know. Today, I am announcing my campaign to be your next governor. Who would have thought less than 24 hours after charges were filed against the political giant she took down, New York Attorney General Lahita James announced a bid for the mansion that she forced Andrew Cuomo out of. James commissioned and then released the report on sexual harassment, alleged sexual harassment, by now former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, he's now charged with a misdemeanor sex crime for allegedly groping the breast of a female staffer. Cuomo has denied the wrongdoing. He's gonna be in court November 17th to answer those charges, but politics goes on. Chadwick Moore, columnist and contributing editor for The Spectator joins us now, New York City resident and commentator. Uh, Chadwick, coincidence? No, I don't think it's a coincidence. And if you just look at what happened it reeks of Albany Democrat Party shenanigans. Uh, the criminal complaint filed in Albany, uh, in which Cuomo will have to appear in court next month, uh, it was filed without knowledge of the prosecutor, the knowledge or consent of the prosecutors in that area, which is highly unusual. And uh, the, the the alleged intent, Andrew Cuomo has been governor for 10 years. He's been a powerful figure for much longer than that. And this alleged incident was very recent, December 2020. A, uh, a misdemeanor, uh, unwanted touch that, uh, that supposedly occurred at the governor's mansion. And Letitia James, in her tweet announcing that she's running for governor, made a point to say she's a person who can take down powerful figures. You know, she's a, you know, a real person, a, a woman of the people who's going to take down all this corruption in Albany and look at what she's doing to one of the most hated men in all of New York State. So, uh, no, I think this reeks of, 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 of politics. And um, uh, Letitia James has been for governor. Now, she does not have jurisdiction in this in this particular case but there are investigations happening all over the state at the moment and so her office could then get involved the attorney general's office this makes an important point about 
New York Democratic politics and that sort of they, Andrew Cuomo was useful during the pandemic to the Democratic Party and he was sort of this figurehead and sat opposite Trump during, President Trump uh, during COVID. And then he was, when he was no longer useful, somehow the Democratic machine was allowed to take him down. How and why? Right. Well, it's, I think before Letitia James announced her candidacy, most people were saying, well, this is a perfect, uh, I mean, think of the biggest scandal to rock Andrew Cuomo. It's the nursing home debts. I mean, that is something extremely gruesome and probably criminal. People say he murdered tens of thousands of people by his uh, actions to move sick people into uh, nursing homes. People had COVID-19, which resulted in many, many deaths. Uh, the Democrat Party, the media does not want to talk about that. Of course, it's way too gruesome to think that one of their guys a big, powerful Democrat could do something like that. So why not let's dredge up Me Too? What else can we get him on? Uh, he's kind of a sleazy guy. I'm not in the business of defending Andrew Cuomo by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but this kind of scene, touching a, a, a touching someone unwanted and not necessarily violently, seems to pale in comparison to the other things that we know he's done and all the other sleazy things he did in office, particularly the nursing home scandal. That's yeah, just well, too much. Then, the yeah, the nursing home scandal and then covering it up and what happened is just awful. Um, you think about this and you wonder when the AG might investigate that and have a report on that. Uh, you talked about the sheriff and it was really interesting when you watched the press conference, what he said, what he didn't say. Take a listen to him. I don't know if it'll go to trial. Um, I think we have um, an overwhelming um, amount of evidence. Um, we have a victim who's been cooperating fully. Such overwhelming evidence, though. Originally, the victim couldn't remember the date it happened. Uh, then you file charges without, as you point out, talking to the DA. Somehow it just happens, which is highly unusual in such a politically charged uh, indictment. And then you hold a news conference the next day to explain your investigation that you hold by yourself. Who's pulling the strings here? Right. Really interesting. And now the alleged victim who didn't remember when it happened, now there's like a precise kind of four or seven minute timeline where we're sure that this thing happened. I don't know how anyone would actually remember that, but it's very precise in the report. And and, um, and even Letitia James's initial report against the governor was sort of full. Of, and again, I'm not in the business of defending Andrew Cuomo. Most people are not. Uh, but it's full of very circumstantial, very strange allegations. It's a lot of he said, she said things that could not be proved. A lot of allegations of a toxic yeah, work environment. Boom, you've got a really meant Chad, to slander him. We we got to run, but don't worry. No one will ever accuse you of defending Andrew Cuomo. We were not we were not <laughs> confused, you. my friend. Have a great weekend. We'll see you you. from the trail in Virginia on Monday. Dan Abrams is next. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.